recreational golfers hit the ball three to four to five grooves higher than tour players do. They're playing fluffier fairways, it's more comfortable to hit it up in the face, and so they're losing 12 to 15 percent of the yardage that's built into that golf club. And then when they hit it high from there, they're losing 20 to 22 percent of the smash factor of the golf club. Whether you play brand A, B, C, D, or my wedges, perfectly well struck wedge shot down on the third or fourth groove, it's going to be a great wedge shot. It doesn't matter who's you play. It's kind of like that driver. If you hit it right dead in the sweet spot, you don't need a 460cc driver. It's not longer because it's bigger, but your average drive is longer because the quarter inch, half inch miss goes as good as a good one. And that's what true with your seven iron, it's true with your hybrid, it's true with your putter for Pete's sake. You play the big mallet butter just and rake it. It's not critical where you hit it off the face. Golf Smarter number 812. If you've seen a wedge used on tour, it doesn't belong in your bag. With Edison Wedge's Terry Kaler. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Terry. It's nice to be back, Fred. I always like visiting with you, and you always ask great questions, so looking oh. for some fun. Thank you very much. So I'll start with the softballs and we'll get, maybe we'll get tougher <laughs> as the time goes on. But um, I'm actually having you on and some various other manufacturers, you know, but the small companies that I love that don't get the attention because they're not on the tour. And uh, I wanted to do it at this time of year because as people are making their holiday wish lists, I want to make sure that they're aware that you guys exist. And well, appreciate it. I, I'm even more so because of all the years that we've been known each other and all the years we've talked to each other and the various companies you have developed through that time, I have got to say that my Edison wedges are the favorite wedges I've ever had from my Callaway wedges to everything that you've done to today. Um, the three wedges that I carry, I have more variety in the shots. I have more success and more confidence in them. I'm even doing something I've never done with a wedge before. I'm starting to juggle the ball. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and that's just confidence. That's just comfort. Yeah. Well, you know, I appreciate that. And and I've been so focused on wedges for 30 years, as you know, and, and Edison, it allowed me at this stage of my life to to really say, you know, I don't care about what anybody else is doing at wedges. How do you design a wedge to be the most forgiving you can possibly make it to deliver the things that golfers have told me they wanted? They want more penetrating trajectories. They want to see more spin. They want to get away with that shot that's not hit quite so good. It's hit a little out on the toe. It's hit a little high in the face. And, and it, it allowed me to just pull out all the stops and I'm not you know, I'm not thinking about irons. I'm not thinking about drivers. It's like, how do I make these high loft scoring clubs the best that I've ever made them? And I took everything I learned from Eidolon, from Score, from Ben Hogan, and the, you know, every piece of feedback I've gotten and I built into these golf clubs for, for, for golfers like you and me. I mean, we're, you know, skilled, but we're still recreational players. We don't do this for a living like the tour player. And I don't really care to develop wedges for him. He's got a totally different set of needs than than you and I and all your listeners have. Absolutely. It's true. Um, and what is it that has enabled you to progress through um, uh, Eidolon, Hogan, Score, and now up to Edison? Uh, is it is the people you're working with? Is it the technology that's available? Is it the rules that you're you're confined by? How come today it's working better than ever before? Well, I think because I was willing to get further outside the box. You know me, I'm an outside the box kind of guy. And, and, um, yes, you are, you know, with, and, and I looked at, you know, I've continued to gather wedge fitting profiles. So there's, there's really three influences. And one is I've continued to gather wedge fitting profiles from golfers and we take them through. And with, at Edison, we call it the wedge fit scoring range analysis. And we take golfers through an interview about, you know, their scoring range and what do their shot shapes look like and what are their, you know, where their misses come up and what le what lofts are they carrying in their bags and, you know, have they ever had their wedges reshafted? Were they custom fitted? We want to learn everything about a golfer's scoring range performance. And what I have collected these kind of profiles now for over 20 years, and I see the same things over and over and over for 20 years. My, my 
launch angles are too high. The ball balloons on me. My misses come up short. I don't get the kind of spin I want. And and what? But what wedges are am I playing? And I look in this in these analyses. Here's the irons the person is playing. And here's the wedges they're playing. Well, ninety eight percent of these people are playing some form of game improvement wedge. I mean iron to get some cavity back, get some perimeter weighting, get some help, which we want. That's why we play a big driver and and hybrids. We want help. It's not our perfect shots that define the round. It's how good are our not so good ones. But then these golfers are all playing a wedge that was specifically designed for a tour player skill set. And I'm Mm -hmm. telling you, the worst tour player that's still making a living doing it is better around the greens than the best club player in America because they spend incessant hours doing that while the club player is selling insurance or cars or working in an office or being a banker or, you know, running a golf club company or a podcast, we don't get to go spend three to four hours every day. And those guys wedges are fine tuned for their specific skills from the grind, the way they like their grooves. And, and, and they've learned to hit all these shots with wedges. And I've talked about this before <clears throat> that really haven't changed very much during their entire lives. And, you know, look at our successful Ryder Cup team. These guys are all in their 20s and 30s. They've been learning the short game with wedges that haven't changed their entire life. So their learning is cumulative, whereas mm. they swing that new 460cc driver different than they swung the driver 15 years ago when they were 15 years old. But they but their wedge learning is cumulative. And so if I change the golf club, I'm going to screw up all that learning. I don't have that restriction because I don't work with tour players. I'm working with Fred Green. I'm working with Terry Kaler's golf buddies. I'm working with these 40,000 people that say, I hit the ball too high. My misses come up short. I don't get enough spin. Well, I can make a wedge to fit uh, fix all that. The tour player probably not going to like it because it won't do what he expects it to do. You're going to mm. like it because it doesn't do what you expect it to do. When you hit it high in the face, it's a good shot. It's not coming up short. So it's all about serving a different master. I mean, I'm not smarter than the guys at the big companies. I just have a different master. I don't care about tour players. I'm, I'm looking for you guys, age, 10s, 12s, 20 handicappers. That's who I care about. That's really fascinating and, a, and an amazing approach. Um, I, I have to bring this up because, you know, we just did have the, the Ryder Cup, um, 2021 Ryder Cup uh, Whistling Straits that just finished this weekend. The, the American team was awfully young for professional golfers. You know, I mean, when, when we were coming up, uh, golfers were seasoned, hard-drinking veterans. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't seem that way anymore, does it? It's a different game on the tour level. Well, I think it, I think it is, and I think in my observation, I think there are reasons for that. Let's go back to when I was a child, and I began watching tour players in the '60s, and Miller Barber and Jack Nicklaus and was coming on, and and Johnny Miller was about to come on, and Tom Watson and these guys. And they're playing golf with persimmon woods and and little bitty forged blades and maybe carrying one sand wedge in their bag, blade putters. And those clubs were just damn hard to master. I mean, Mm. mean, Ben Hogan, you know, hit his peak in his career after he was 35 because it takes a long time back then to learn to master these, these golf clubs. The golf clubs to now are more forgiving. The kids are faster, stronger. They go to the gym every day. I mean, Gary Player was a freak because he actually worked out, if you remember. And now you can't play competitive golf if you don't go to the gym all the time. And the game, I mean, these these kids all have exquisite skills, but they play a different game than was played back then because their equipment allows them to. They go at it harder than they ever did, but they have to. You can't compete on the tour if you hit it 275 off the tee. You're not going to make a living on the tour. You've got to hit it. 290, 300, 310 to be competitive. And, and, and the greens, I think, are the other big part of it. I mean, the greens are so fast, they're so slick. And, and I've written about this because I designed the putters when I first got into golf. If you look at the evolution of greens agronomy and the evolution of putter design, the evolution of putting style, it's a, it's a coordinated triangle. And every advancement in green speed, you know, when, when, they first adopted the stint meter. I don't know if you know this, the USGA. Oakmont had the fastest greens in the country, which it's noted for, and they were 9.8. You know, your Muni course has 9.8 or 10.10 greens now because agronomy practices have changed so much. And the tour guys are putting on 11s, 12s, 15s. 
So putters got heavier. They got more center shafted. You went to the claw. You went to left hand low. You went to arm lock. You went to long putters. Trying to compensate, figure out how to handle these super fast greens. Um, they also roll like pool tables. I think the modern tour players make a lot more putts than the old guys did because they don't have spike marks. You know, the greens are rolled. They're smooth. I mean, you watch on PGA Tour, you watch the close-ups, and the ball rolls so beautifully smooth across the green. Most of us don't get to play greens like that. So we don't make as many putts as they do, partly because we're not as good as them, but partly also we don't get to put perfect surfaces all the time, and they do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But these guys, these young guns, they're fearless, I think, too, is another thing about it, you know. So, um, you know, and they've got an all-exempt tour, which we've had for a long time, and they're just fearless. And um, and they hit it hard, and and if the wind isn't blowing, if you watch the scores and watch the golf, it blew hard on Saturday. But if the wind isn't blowing, these guys can take it to the golf course. And if the wind is blowing, that's a hazard for all of us. I live down on the Texas coast. I play 15 to 20 mile an hour wind every day. And I had a magical round last week that the wind didn't blow quite as hard. And But it's hard to get the ball close to the hole to judge launch and trajectory when the wind is blowing. It's the, best, the biggest hazard in golf is the wind. So, And most of our golf is not played in windy environments. You know, it's played in the middle of the country and – the flags are drooping there and the greens are soft, but these guys are deadly when you give them that. All right, let's take a quick time out. We'll be back right after this. You just said you had a magical round. Whoa, wait, wait, you can't let that one go by. Tell me about your magical round. Well, I've been blessed my whole life. I got great instruction as a kid. I uh, played scratch golf all through my 20s and 30s and 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 played, you know, good golf courses and and I shot some rounds in the 60s back then and and then in my 40s, 50s and um as I got into my 60s my I not playing enough and effects of aging and my handicap has slipped up to, you know, five or six at times and I've gotten it back down to two but I, I set myself a goal. I'm turning 70 next March, and I, I set myself a goal that I think I could shoot my age before I turn 70 if I worked on my putting and, and worked on my mental game a little better. And last Sunday, I had a uh, I hadn't done it yet, but last Sunday, I had a friend come over to the new club I've joined, wonderful little club designed by Bill Coor, uh, right when he and Crenshaw were getting together. It's a wonderful little golf course. Um, and just had a magical round at a six birdie, no bogey round of 65 and wow. just totally, totally smoked, you know, shooting my age. And, um, it was, I made, it was really, it was really interesting. I'm, I, uh, I hit two approaches. Uh, I have to plug with Edison wedges to inside a foot for two birdies. And, um, I made four putts of, uh, of 12 to I, one of them. My longest putt's probably about 35 feet. I made four more birdies and, I two putted, you know, the other twelve greens, and uh, I hit some great lag putts. It was weird, and when I got through, my playing partner on the on the last hole, I lagged about a thirty foot putt. It was a pretty long hole, and and I lagged, lagged about a thirty foot putt up to about eighteen twenty inches. He goes, "That's the longest par putt you've had all day." I went, "Wow, you're right. I have. I really haven't had to putt. I just, you know, all my pars were tap ins. It was just magical." And I, and I and I wrote my blog. You know, I write at uh, Golf WRX. I write as the wedge guy, and I wrote my blog about it last week. About you know, because I went back as I am. You know me. What happened? How did I do that? What was the magic of that? How did I make that magic happen? And and I really dissected it into to lessons from the round of a lifetime, which I wrote about last week. Congratulations! Congratulations. A, 60, oh, six, a sixty-five at sixty-nine years old. Yeah, it was really magical. Wow. But, but I, Congratulations, but really reduced, buddy. That's great. I, I reduced it to three things, too, you know, that were interesting. I think everybody listening can take tips from this. I had a friend playing had never played the golf course. So instead of saying, hit it down the left side of the fairway, I was giving him very specific lines. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that red roof down straight away, those two trees that make a Y down there, that child's place that you see through the dog leg in that backyard. So I was giving him very specific lines, and I always loved the Mel Gibson line from the Patriot of aim small, miss small. So because I was giving him these very specific targets, I was taking, not just hit it down there. I mean, I'm hitting it at that target. That. So my T-ball stayed in play all day long, right where I wanted it. And I was giving him similar lines off the 
off on the greens and going, hey, where that flag is, you want to be right of it. Where that flag is, you want to be putting from behind that flag. You want to be putting from front of that flag. So I was so mentally tuned in. Uh, I was out of, got out of my own way, basically. Um, and I had a really good putting round. And, and if, whether it's the tour or whether it's all of us out there trying to break 100 or 90 or 80 or whatever, a good putting day, you're probably going to do it. And a bad putting day, you're not. And so I had a very mm-hmm. good putting day. Uh, as I mentioned, I never had to struggle over a par putt. Um, I, I made four birdie putts of, of 12 to 20 feet and or three of them, and then one 35-foot bomb that always helps. Um, but if you watch the tour guys, the guys that are going lower out putting everybody this week, and whether it's a tour player or whether you're a 20 handicapper, that, that last 20, 30 yards, you know, you're chipping your putt. If those are good, you're going to probably shoot a great round for you. And if those things aren't good, you're going to probably chop it up a little bit. So yeah. playing yesterday yeah. was hard. Well, that, was 65, well, that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, aim small, miss small. It really is. That's that's what got me started with Golf Smarter in the first place was someone saying, you know, how am I playing this hole? And, and it's like, don't just tell me to hit a five iron, right? It, it's like, ha, give me a target. Give me something that I, I know concrete that I can go with. And actually, the only hole in one I ever hit was just after on a course I'd never played. Um, we we're with some fr- I was with some friends, and I and I just kind of remember describing what kind of shot you need on this hole. To have you know a nice high lofted soft bounce, and it you know that's going to keep you on the green. And I I made a hole in one. And that was, oh, what, uh, 11 years ago now? Even getting yeah. close to 12. Um, yeah, of course you, you need to make some bombs on that. But I think that your wedge game, and to me, what's really improved my game more than anything is getting close, uh, giving yourself shorter putts. Um, even because, you know, we don't always hit the green in regulation. So we're around the green and we have to chip it up. And it really is uh, a difference when you're using a wedge that you're confident in and it can do different things for you. Well, exactly right. And if, and if you look at, you know, when I, one of the things that I guess is the reason I build wedges the way I do and design them the way I do is I've, I've been putting wedges on the Iron Byron Swing Robot to, to see what club heads do. You know, Iron Byron isolates the golfer and the shaft. It's like, hey, this is what the club head does. I can put the ball the impact point, you know, a half an inch up the face for perfect impact. I can move it a half an inch up of there. I can move the ball impact point around because Iron Byron is going to make sure I hit it in that, in that targeted spot. And when I put wedges from every company for 20 years, I've seen no changes and your, your readers all know that ball that's hit a little high in the face is not going to go anywhere. It's going to pop up in the air and it's going to come up short with minimal spin because it was hit up high in the face and there's no mass in a wedge up in high in the face. By the same token, a wedge hit on the toe. There's not much mass out there. That ball is not going to get to the hole. It's not going to have the spin. The ball hit down in that third or fourth groove is the perfect shot. It's going to launch nice and low. It's going to have a lot of spin on it. And, you know, one of the big differences between tour players and the rest of us is they constantly make contact down on that third, fourth, fifth groove. And I mean, I get, we have a demo program. So I get demo clubs back and I get to watch recreational golfers hit the ball three to four to five grooves higher than tour players do. They just do. They're playing fluffier fairways. It's more comfortable to hit it up in the face. And so they're losing 12 to 15% of the yardage that's built into that golf club. And then when they hit it high from there, they're losing 20 to 22% of the, of the smash factor of the golf club. You know, whether you play brand A, B, C, D, or my wedges, a perfectly well-struck wedge shot down on the third or fourth groove is going to be a great wedge shot. It doesn't matter who's you play. But we amateurs, it's kind of like that driver. If you hit it right dead in the sweet spot, you don't need a 460cc driver. It's not longer because it's bigger, but your average drive is longer because the quarter-inch, half-inch miss goes as good as a good one, almost. But nobody's ever, and that's what true with your seven iron, it's true with your hybrid. Nobody ever did that. It's true with your putter for Pete's sake. You play the big mallet putter, just you know, rake it. It doesn't, it's not critical where you hit it on the face. But your wedges are super finicky and critical about where you hit it. Whether you're if you're playing a tour designed wedge, you know, you're if you hit it a half an inch high, 
you're going to lose 12 to 15 percent of your distance. It's the laws of physics. You can't practice that out. And and I'm telling you, watch tour golf. These guys knock flags down with wedges a lot. But watch these guys, and they come up 40 and 50 feet short every once in a while with a with a full swing wedge shot. These guys don't misjudge distance 50 feet from 90 yards. They're better than that. But if they hit it a little high in the face, their wedge is going to come up short just like yours because you're trying to play the same wedge they're playing. And their wedges are made for their short game skills. They aren't made to be forgiving. And, you know, I tell the story all the time. If I took a tour player and put my wedge in his hands, he may hit some full shots and go, wow, this is very consistent. But if he gets up by the green, he knows how to hit a shot to carry 24 feet with this amount of spin at that trajectory or 32 feet or 12 feet. He knows those distances. He takes my 57 degree and he's got this little shot. He wants to carry it 25 feet with a certain amount of spin and let it roll out. And he hits it and it carries 32 feet with more spin. He goes, I can't use this. It didn't do what I expected. If you give him a driver that just, it's just five yards longer, it'll go in the bag tomorrow because he, he'd like that unexpected result. He can't afford an unexpected result around the greens. And he's got thousands of hours of practicing with the same brand A, B, C, D wedges that he's always played. Doesn't matter whose brand they are. They're almost all identical. And they're identical to the ones he had five years ago and 10 years ago. So his learning is cumulative. If I change his wedge performance, all that learning is out the window. He's got to go relearn. You know, and I mean, Phil Mickelson, I think, was the one that said he's got, you know, three foot square concrete blocks on his practice where he practices and he can hit balls to each of those concrete blocks from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 63. When Tom, when Tom kite made the, the lob with the original 60 degree lob wedge famous, they said at 63 yards, he hits it inside five feet almost every time at 63 yards. That's the magic number. The rest of us can't do that because if I hit it a little high on the face, a little low on the face, a little on the toe, it doesn't go 63. It goes 68. It goes 41, you know. And so I just I said, why can't I bring forgiveness to wedges that you demand out of your irons, out of your driver, out of your hybrids? It's really that simple. And the tour player doesn't want that. You and I and all your listeners need that. That's why I do it that way. And I wish it was that simple. (laughs) <laughs> you make it sound that simple, and, but I think execution wise, it's not, I want to take another time out. Um, and I want to talk more about spin off of a wedge and we'll do that with Terry Kaler after this. Uh, two things you mentioned in the last segment there that, that I, I want to talk about. And first of all, um, when you talk about how we, the amateur golfer hits the ball higher up on the face than the pro. Is that why they can get so much spin on the ball? I'm, I'm still kind of lost on what it is that it, what does it take to get so much spin? These guys, they hit it past the hole and just zip it right back to the pin. Um, well, is that the how you're you're hit it or what you're hitting it with? So, I've written about this a lot because spin has really three primary contributors to spin. You've got the coefficient of friction on the face. So if you have grass and water on the face of the golf club, you can't put that much spin on it. You have the, and that's where grooves and face texture come into play. You have club head speed. You know, a a golfer that hits a pitching wedge 160 is going to spin a lot more than a guy that hits pitching wedge 80 yards because club head speed produces spin. The biggest contributor to spin that's kind of across the board for all of us is the dynamics of the club head itself, a thing we call gear effect. And gear effect, to simple it down, is how much of the mass of that golf club head is above the point of impact on the ball and how much of mass is below the point of impact. So if you, let's use drivers as an example. The holy grail of driving distance is high launch, low spin. And to get that, all the driver companies are going to carbon fiber crowns. They're they're building these faces and these shells as thin as they can so they can put as much weight in the bottom of the golf club as they can. So if the weight is all below the point of impact, then the ball wants to launch high with minimal spin. Now go look at your wedge. If you hit wedges up in the middle of the face, 
all the mass on that wedge is below the point of impact. So the ball is going to want to launch high with minimal spin. By nature, a wedge is the least efficient spinning club in the bag because all the mass is below the impact point. Tour players hit the ball down on the third or the fourth groove so that they get more mass behind the ball and even above the ball. Then they add the club head speed to quality of contact. They play tighter fairways. All those things come into play, and they have great skills. Okay, so But for the recreational golfer, the, the irony of wedges is these are the clubs we want to spin the ball with, and they're the clubs least designed to generate spin. They generate loft. They generate height because of 55, 58 degrees. But because all the weight's on the bottom, the club by nature is not going to optimize spin. What I did with Edison is I moved more mass up in the top of the golf club than anyone ever has by a factor of two or three or four. The ball's going to go in the air. It's got 45, 49, 50, 55 degrees aloft. That ball's going in the air. What I'm trying to do is in, is bring the launch angle down on a loft to loft basis, which then also dramatically increases spin. And where you really see it with these golf clubs is on those mid range shots that you don't have club head speed, 30 yards, 60 yards, 80 yards. If you think about it, if Justin Thomas hits a 70 yard wedge shot and you hit a 70 yard wedge shot, you're going to have pretty close to the same club head speed because the ball's only supposed to go 70 yards. Now, if he swings a wedge full and you swing it full, he's probably hitting it 30 yards further than you because his club head speed at full swing is more advanced than yours. But if you get down into those intermediate ranges, he doesn't hit a 50 yard shot with 20% more club head speed than you do. It's only supposed to go 50 yards, but he hits it pinches the ball properly, hits it low in the face, and you're playing a fluffier fairway, and you don't pinch the ball that efficiently. And so you hit it higher in the face, the ball goes higher with less spin. It's built into the golf club. There's nothing you can do about that. It's kind of like you took a persimmon driver out. It's wow. not going to be as long and straight as your metal wood. Nothing you can do about it. Right. 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 Can you, can you please explain to me Smash Factor? Smash Factor is – really a simple concept. It is the ratio of club speed to ball speed. So in drivers, if you have a 100 mile an hour club head speed, driver technologies are giving that ball 135 to 140 miles an hour of ball speed because of the trampoline effect of the face and the efficiency of impact and the golf ball. Okay. If you get into a seven iron, a 90 mile an hour club head speed might deliver a club head speed might deliver 120 miles an hour of ball speed because an iron face is not as dramatically, you know, effective as a driver face. If you get down into a wedge, a well-struck wedge shot has a smash factor of about 1.16 or so. So if you swing a wedge at 80 miles an hour, the ball may the the, the ball will leave the club at maybe 88 or 89 miles an hour. And that's what smash factor is. The problem with tour design wedges is the smash factor on the fourth groove is 1.16. But on the seventh groove, it's 1.01. And on the ninth or 10th groove up in the face, it's 0.92. So because the, up, I mean, anybody can look at their wedge, there's no mass in the top of the golf club. So the ball can't take on as much energy from the club as it could if it was down where the mass was. So, you know, it, and it's, it's a relatively simple concept is smash factor is the efficiency of the club to deliver, to translate club head speed into ball speed. And on a driver, the big drivers, you know, the smash factor may not drop off, but two or three or 4% with a half inch miss. But on a wedge, it's dropping off 12 or 15% with a half inch miss high in the face or on the toe. So I hit that ball a little high in the face. Everybody listening can relate. Ball was sitting up in a rub. I felt it high in the face, front bunker. Knew that before I ever looked up. My question is, why is that acceptable in my wedge when it's not acceptable in my eight iron or my four wood or my driver? But it's acceptable in my wedge? Heck no, it's not. I have to get the ball close to the hole. And if I miss it a half an inch, I want 95% of the distance, not 84% of the distance. You know, I'm gonna maybe end up with a 20 foot uphill putt instead of a bunker shot because the club was more efficient. And again, a perfectly hit shot down on the third or fourth groove, my wedge, everybody else's wedge are all about the same. 1.16, 1.18 smash factor. The difference is 
that half inch high miss. Mine is preserving 95% of the smash factor and every other wedge on the market's losing 15 to 20% of the smash factor. And that makes the, the miss be better. And I, I mean, your best shots are fine. I mean, I hit a lot of great shots shooting that 65 last week, but I got away with some mediocre shots. You know, I missed the sweet spot a quarter inch, half an inch, and I still left myself a 15 foot birdie putt instead of a bunker shot. And you made the birdie putt. <laughs> a I made lot a of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is my, my, my friend that was along for the ride, and he was playing with me, of course. And he said, you know, you missed like eight putts inside of 20 feet. I said, well, yeah, but I made some too. But I mean, it could have been even lower, but I'm not complaining. You yeah. know, the better a round we shoot, every, every best round, you can always say, but what if, right? Yeah, that's that makes no that's, You never shoot a round going, there's no place I could have saved a shot. That's you know, why we keep happen. coming back. It's why we keep coming the, back. Because could always yeah. do just one one more, well, a little bit better yeah. next time. So about, yeah. it, I think it was about 2010, the USGA came down with these rules about the grooves and wedges and, mm -hmm. and changed things. Did it make a big difference? And what, what were the rule changes? How did it impact you as a wedge manufacturer? And did it really make a big difference for the rest of us? I think it made a huge difference. You know, that, that, rule, that rule change, it changed the way we measure grooves. But the main thing it did that affected us we were by that time we were starting to, to CNC machine the grooves rather than stamp them in place or cast them in place. So we were cutting very sharp edges on the edges of grooves. And you remember they would shred some golf balls. You'd get little threads of cover off your golf ball because those edges were so sharp. The main thing in the rule change in 2010 was that we had to round the edges of the grooves to a 0 0.010 radius. Now, Machining techniques since that time have improved where we can hit that 0 0.010 tighter than we could back then. But but the basic shape of the groove, the USGA has not changed the rules since then. And the only thing that's improved is our grooves may be 2% better, 5% better than they were in 2011 when we had to start making grooves the new way. Our manufacturing consistencies, everything are better than they were. But the, the groove pre-2010 had a, like a, I mean, a sharp, sharp edge on it. It would bite into the golf ball better. And, and where my whole diversion from tour wedges, uh, tour type, tour looking wedges happened with the score line in, in 2011 that I introduced, which put progressive weighting in wedges. Because when I was testing various new groove geometries, what I found is, Groove A to groove B to groove C didn't make very much difference. But if you hit it a half an inch lower in the face, the spin went way up and the launch angle went down. And so I started packing weight higher and higher in the golf club. I said, well, it's the, it's the gear effect thing. The more weight I can get above the point of impact, the lower the launch angle and the higher the spin rate's going to be. You know, we've all know the old line of thin to win. You catch an iron shot kind of thin. It's a little hot, but boy, it hits the green and it sizzles because so much of the mass of that club head was above the point of impact. So I said, well, let me just put the mass in the golf club above the point of impact. So it'll be there for Joe average golfer. That's going to hit wedges more in the middle of the face than the tour player does. So, you know, when you look down at a club face, you don't think I need to almost blade this shot to get a good shot. You think, man, I want to hit right in the center of the face. That's kind of logical. I want to hit it in the screws at the sweet spot. And the sweet spot of a wedge is down around the third groove, not up in the middle of the face. Well, I said, well, hey, my amateur golfer customer, he hits it in the middle of the face. I want to make that the best place on the golf club to hit it. So, um, and that just generates a lot of spin. What we found is I can affect spin more with club head design than I can with grooves. So one of the things we did is we built an Edison wedge with no grooves at all, okay? and then tested it against the Edison wedge with, with our factory, you know, our stock grooves on a perfectly dry golf ball. This is the key, a perfectly dry golf ball. Our club with no grooves had 85 to 86% of the spin of the club with grooves. But on a, we took some tour design wedges and we fill the grooves in with epoxy, and polish the face back on a tour design wedge on a perfectly struck ball. 
the the smooth face wedge would lose 35 to 45 percent of the spin on a dry ball ours would lose 15. the real difference is when you inject moisture and the grass and the things that get between the club and the ball that's what grooves are like the tread on your tires on a golf club that's all they're there for so if you think about formula one racing on dry tracks they run slicks because they maximize the fr coefficient of friction with the track but if it starts raining they have to put tires on that have tread so that they can squeegee the water away the grooves on the facer golf club are there primarily to squeegee away grass and moisture so that the, the ball can make contact with the face of the golf club and prevent a flyer all right let's take another quick time out last one and then we'll be back after this this week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 128 is part one with Jamie Zimron, our golf sensei, who introduces us and breaks down her Bliss Golf Improvement Program. If you watch the pros, the one thing that stands out all the time in the pros' golf swings is their balance. When they're addressing the golf ball in the dynamic motion of the swing, and at the end of their swing, they're standing there in what my Mexican doctor, Kiai Golfer, calls posa. <laughs> they're, they're posing. They're in perfect balance, standing there watching their beautiful shots. The biggest difference between amateurs and professionals is their balance, I would say. That's episode 128 of Golf Smarter Mulligans being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are available from where you're listening to this podcast right now. Please write a review, subscribe, and follow both of our golf podcasts so that you can download or stream the brand new episode when it becomes available on your favorite listening device. I think of you as a small town Texas kind of guy, right? So I, I don't see you big, big city at all. I don't see you big city at all. But if... You were in the big city and you had to get on an elevator. And I don't think you see a lot of elevators from where you live. <laughs> What's your elevator pitch for Edison Wedges? What do you tell people that, that if you had just a short amount of time to say, this is why you need this wedge, how do you do it? So uh, I, one thing I've used at demo days is, so you know that wedge shot that you hit high in the face that doesn't go anywhere? You know that shot, Fred? Sure. Like, what if the next time you hit one high in the face, it went as good as a good one? That's what we do. We make the high face wedge shot as good as a good one. It's really that simple. What's the future of wedges? What's happening next? What, what, where are we going with this? Well, I'm kind of really curiously and, and proudly watching all the major brands are starting to thicken the top of their wedges a little bit. They're, they're restricted mm -hmm. by how much the tour player who they validate their golf clubs with will let them do that. But you look at the new wedges from most of the major brands and they're putting some mass up on the top of the golf club. And I congratulate them for learning what I've been doing for 25 years. My, my Reed Lockhart wedges of 1995 are thicker in the top of the club than any of the new wedges on the market. My Edison wedges are 50% thicker than that because I can because I don't have tour players. But again, the big companies are restricted by their tour staff because they can't, they, I mean, and there are some brilliant wedge people out there. Bob Oakey and the whole Tideless team, Roger Cleveland, the whole Callaway team. And these are brilliant people. They know a lot more about golf clubs than I'll ever know. But they have to consider their tour players. They design their clubs with their tour players. And all the different grinds that are out there, every one of them was developed for a particular tour player. And then they decided maybe we'll add that grind to the product line. But if you went out on the tour and took a close look at wedges, every one of those guys has – you know, the Titleist team, the Callaway team, the TaylorMade team, whatever, custom grinding their soul for their particular preferences and desires. And if they go to a different golf course, they have a different set of wedges ground for them. The rest of us just like, I, I got to select a set of wedges. I'm going to spend five or $600. And I travel a little bit. I play my home club. I play with my buddies. I play in a member guest. I take two or three golf vacations. These wedges need to work everywhere I go. And the tour player... He's changing wedges from Texas to Florida to Ohio to New England to California. They're changing their wedges for those turf conditions. Well, that's great because they get them all free and they get special attention. The rest of us, I mean, that's why I designed the sole that I did. It's like, I don't know where you're playing next. I don't know what your next lie looks like. 
I take great offense to the idea of bounce fitting. I don't think it's possible because I don't know what your next lie is going to look like. Do you take the same dip every time? You're a, a good player. You're what, an eight or 10, 12 handicapper. That's a good player, but you don't take the same dip every time. You know, you yeah, get it a little thinner yeah, sometimes than others, and sometimes you sweep it, and sometimes you dig it a little bit. I don't have control of that. How am I going to fit that? The only way I can fit that is if you make sure you play the same lie every time and you make the same swing every time. Well, that's not practical. So I designed a soul, the Kaler soul, I call it. I've called it a bunch of different things in the 25 years since I designed it. I put a high bounce in the front, a low bounce in the back, so you don't have to think about it. I did that for you. If it's if it's a softer lie, it's going to act like a high bounce wedge. If it's a tighter lie, it's going to act like a low bounce wedge. Because that's the only thing you can't fit. I can fit your shaft. I can fit your line angle, I can fit your length, I can fit your grip size, I can get the right lofts in your bag. I can't fit the bottom of the golf club because I don't know what your next shot's going to look like. Did you happen to see I'm sorry? Yeah, did you happen to see on Friday at Ryder Cup the shot that Jordan Spieth made on 17 when his ball was in like 18 (laughs) inches of rough on a a 90-degree face of a of just just the uh, a wall a straight up wall and the ball just went straight up and landed softly a couple and, of and if you look i saw a video of i saw the couple of plays of it and then i saw a video of it with the shot tracer on it i mean the ball went right. it went probably 60 feet in the air but it only traveled about 20 feet toward the hole i mean it, that kid's magical we've seen him do stuff and i mean but but it's not like he has skills that nobody else has. He has great imagination. But all those guys out there have shots that, I mean, if you remember at the Masters, and I'm trying to remember who it was, that one of the players was in the hunt. How was it? Morikawa. But he hit it over 15 green all the way back by the lake. You know, that green runs away toward the front lake. He hits a perfect bump and run wedge shot. It hits, you know, just before the edge of the green, takes a grab, hops over the collar and trickles down to like three feet. I guarantee you the best guy at your golf club could stand back there for a week and never get that ball to do that. But that, those guys know, as I mentioned this before, they know how to hit it just here on the face of the club to make it launch like this, spin like that, and carry exactly that far. They can, they can manipulate spin, launch, and carry distance independently of one another. They can carry it. 23 feet with a lot of spin, 23 feet with almost no spin. I mean, I work with Ben Crenshaw, and I learned more about wedges than one afternoon with Ben watching him do things. And he made a comment, I don't want the wedge to spin the ball. I want to spin the ball. Wow. No, the rest of us, I want my wedge to spin the ball because I don't know how to spin the ball as well as Ben Crenshaw right. and all these other guys. Right. So, you know, again, that tour player, you know, if you remember when they, we talked about the rules change in grooves, the tour players liked it when they took that all that spin out of the grooves because now what, what Ben said, they can spin the ball rather than have the club spinning the ball. But, but you do have to have clean grooves. If you watch most of the guys around the greens and they'll take their practice shots and then they'll take the club head and put it over toward the caddy seat and wipe that face off so that they're hitting their shot with fresh, clean grooves. The rest of us, we go over there, we got that chip shot, we take eight or 10 practice shots, we fill our grooves full of dirt and grass, and then we hit the shot and wonder why it didn't spin. I mean, hey guys, that tr- that gr- that the grooves in the golf club are designed to channel away grass and dirt. If they're already full of grass and dirt, they can't do that. So, you know, um, that and I think that's a big tip. Anybody around the greens, if you'll just wipe the face of your club before you actually hit that little pitch shot after your two or three practice wings or 10 to get the feel of it, take your towel, wipe the face off, and then hit your shot. You're going to get more spin out of it because the grooves will be clean. Oh, I take a, I take oh. a metal brush. I'm kind of obsessive about, uh, about brushing my club faces before I take a swing and after I take mm-hmm. the swing. My friends think I'm a little bit nuts, but I don't think so. I got to have it clean. <laughs> All golfers are a little bit nuts or we wouldn't play this crazy game. Right? <laughs> so you're going to be at the PGA Merchandise Show in Orlando in 2022? Well, if they have it, you know, I'm, I'm hearing rumors that it's still maybe a little up in the air. But I think, you know, with the college football stadiums being full and the pro football stadiums being full and Major League Baseball crowds are back and the world isn't coming to an end, I'm hoping that, that we will get back to having the show. But 
you know, I think a lot of people may not have missed it all that much last year. I love to go because I see old friends and and more about that, and just going and hanging, you know, with our company. We always make it an outing and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, if it's there, I mean, last year would have been my 40th one in a row. So, yeah, I'm kind of in the habit of going doing that every January. I'm, I'm looking forward because this year may be, if it happens, and if it's safe, I'm hoping that I will uh, get to go this year. So maybe we'll get to finally meet face to face. It's a possibility. That would, would be great. Well, we'll stay in touch between now and then. That is, you know, we've known each other oh, for absolutely. what 15 years, 12, 15 years, and we actually never have met face to face. Yeah. That's funny. No, no. We actually, um, I started doing the podcast in 2005, and you were early on in the game with me, and we've gone through this a lot together. So, no, we've been talking for a long time through multiple administrations, let's say. Right. <laughs> we've all come and go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we've become pretty good friends. How's your supply chain going? Uh, is Has that been hurt? I think everybody in every industry, I haven't talked to anybody in any industry. It's not having supply chain issues. And, and, you know, it's, and it's as much about freight terminals as it is about supply. We have a, a great uh, relationship with our foundry that makes our golf club heads. We're in good shape there. Shafts have been a little dicey at times. Uh, grips have been very dicey at times. And uh, it, it keeps you on your toes because, you know, when we have, um, we started with one grip and then the supply of that grip became just, you know, uh, unreliable. So we shifted over to another grip and it looks like we're going to have to do that again. I mean, we've got to have grips to make golf clubs, but, um, you know, supply chain has been a little challenging for everybody and it has for my other non-golf company that I have. And it has for people and whether it's in the grocery business or the hardware business or, you know, I mean, supply chains have been disrupted over the last year and a half and we're not, we're not out of that by any means. I think we still have a long way to go. All right, last piece of advice before we wrap this up today, and that would be the amount of wedges we should be carrying and why. Well, I think, you know, I mean, obviously I'm in the wedge business. I think you ought to have a bag full, but not really. But I think that, that your wedge gapping is so brutally critical, and you need to know the, the loft of your nine iron. And, and lofts continue to get cranked down. There's a lot of nine irons out there now that are 38, 39 degrees, which that club had a seven on it when I was learning golf in the sixties and then it started having an eight on it. And now it's getting a nine on it. Um, but it's still a 38 or 39 degree golf club. And I, I think if you're a stronger distance profile, you should not go less than, than, or more than four degree gapping in your, in your wedges. If you're, you know, maybe a senior or you're just not as strong a junior or lady that maybe a nine iron is a 110 yard club for you and not 150, then I think you can go to five degree gapping in your wedges. I think it starts with knowing what your nine iron is and it ends with what's the highest loft wedge you'd like to have in your arsenal. You know, I mean, I personally am not a high loft guy. We make fabulous lob wedges of 61, 63 degrees. I carry a 57, this highest loft wedge I want. And I hit a lot of shots with my 53, but you know, my, my nine iron is, is a 41 degree golf club. So I play wedges at 45, 49, 53 and 57. And, and that gives me the full swing gapping. Uh, my golf course has, has got, when you have a wedge in your hand, it's serving you up a very tiny green typically. And so distance control is brutally crucial, which is why the Edison wedges are designed the way they are, but that's also why I gap them at four degrees. Um, and then, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer, you get the gapping right, and, and please, please, please do not overlook your wedge shafts. So many people are going to lightweight steel in their irons, graphite in their irons, regular flexes. Um, don't get those wedges off the rack with that heavy, stiff steel shaft if you're playing the lighter weight golf club in your irons. You want a seamless transition. You want that that pitching wedge and that gap wedge to feel like that nine iron and eight iron. You want it to, the, the shaft to load and unload. So if you've been fitted for irons, take that shaft profile. It's graphite, put graphite in your wedges. If it's 80 grams, put 80 grams in your wedges. And and it will make dramatic differences. And the other thing I think, even for people that are still trying to play steel shafts in their irons, the tour players can hit lots of different shots with their wedges, but think of their form and hand strength compared to yours. Can you really handle the same weight wedge they handle with a fraction of their hand strength and their form strength? 
you know, and I, I find a lot of people going a little lighter in the wedges gives you a lot more abilities around the greens. Not dramatically lighter, but a little lighter. So, <laughs> uh, Well, always great advice. You are just a wealth of information that is so helpful and has always been helpful for me. So once again, thank you so much. It's always fun, Fred, and you always ask great questions. And uh, thanks <laughs> thank for you. letting me relive that round of golf from last Sunday, that 65, that was fun. And wow. Uh, and, and for sharing the story, because we have a very different story than everybody else. So thanks for letting us share it. So I'm going to be on vacation next week, planning on playing at TPC Danzante Bay, which was named Mexico's best golf course in 2020 by the World Golf Awards. Maybe I'll even get a chance to sit down with a director of golf to learn more about the property, facilities, and what makes this course so compelling. But if that happens, I'll share it with you after I get back. But there will be a brand new episode of Golf Smarter next week. Now, starting with today's episode, I've invited a number of guests who've been featured before that have small golf companies that would never be heard from because they don't have the marketing budgets to be showcased on the PGA Tour. But they still make great products that benefit amateur golfers. Isn't that what Terry talked about? So I just thought, if you're thinking of putting together your holiday wish list, we'd better get some keen insights and information to assist your buying decisions. Uh, now, you'll probably hear more about this when we have Gabe Coyne of Sticks.Golf on. But yesterday, my buddy Neil and I played a round that had four elements to it, which was a ton of fun. We competed on match play, stroke play, and fewest number of putts. But the catch is we could only do it with seven clubs. Now, interestingly, Sticks Golf had sent me five clubs before so this was the first time I had a chance to try them out. Let's just say we were both surprised at how much fun and challenging it was. And you'll learn about the results when we do the full episode with Gabe. Hopefully that's going to be next week. So please keep your, uh, your ears open for that. <laughs> Golf Smarter is your podcast for a caddy. And like caddies, we graciously accept any and all tips for services provided. And want to thank Robert for his really generous donation this past week. That tip jar is now open. Just click on donate at golfsmarter.com.